in-person kickoff meeting for round 20 grantees. Um, today is going to be a little bit different than what I expected and that um, what you may have expected. The really good news is that our program manager, Tiffany Tiarina, has had her baby. Uh, her name is Sophie and she's super cute and uh, she came into the world a little bit early. So things were nebulous for the past couple of weeks on what was going to happen uh, in terms of just everything, all of our schedules, including the kickoff meeting. Uh, but baby Sophie has done so well uh, at the hospital that she is now able to come home. So Tiffany is on leave. She is taking care of baby Sophie. Um, our library is going to have a little baby shower for her uh, pretty soon. And yeah, uh, oh, thanks, Rich, for the, uh, the library card catalog. <laughs> yeah, and congratulations to her and her husband, Josh, the whole family. Um, because of that, we're not going to do a couple of things that two people could do when they're running a meeting. One of them is breakout sessions. We just can't do it. Um, that, you know, I can't be in two places at two times telling two different things. If I clone myself, I also would have a baby trying to run the meeting and that doesn't work either. So um, we are going to just do everything together. It'll probably wind up being shorter as a result. I'm really sorry if you want to get all of your money's worth and go until 4 p.m., but it may be a little shorter than that today. Uh, so yeah, welcome one and all. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do is an ALG quick look. Hey, look, screen share tour with Tiffany. Well, she's not here, so I'm going to do it. So I am going to share my screen and it's going to look weird for a second here because we're going to be looking at teams. OK, here we go. So. If you're new to affordable learning Georgia, I mean, you, you've probably already learned plenty about OER through the asynchronous, especially through the asynchronous training and because you wrote a great proposal and you're here and congratulations for that. Um, affordable learning Georgia itself has some good resources that you you'll want to keep in mind and I'm going to make sure that I have the uh, chat somewhat open here so that I can see if anyone has questions in the meantime. Oh, yep, uh, Dr. Joe says congrats uh, to Tiffany too. Excellent. Oh, and so does Shaynaz, and so does uh, Dimajana uh, Ghosh. Excellent. All right, so um, on the ALG website, there are a couple things that you'll want to know, and I'm going to go to the most important one first. Um, our grants have a hub and it's the affordable materials grants button the big one right here you can also go to about and affordable materials grants it's an about section i i, I keep wanting to change the organization of this over and over again we've tightened it up eh, not quite yet but anyway you click on that you'll go to affordable materials grants it'll give you an about the grants thing but the big thing you need to keep in mind here is the grantee information center this used to be one page per round that gave you the deadlines, the report links, etc. Now we've brought it all together. Um, we have pretty uniform rounds in terms of timelines now. It works a lot better to just have it all in one place. And the Grantee Information Center is the place for that. So let's say you come across the question, when is my report due? That's at the Grantee Information Center. If you have um, how do I get a particular form template? Uh, how do I know how to do all this? That's at the Grantee Information Center. If you're looking at this recording and you're going, how do I get those kickoff materials that happened today? They're at the Grantee Information Center. So this is affordablelearninggeorgia.org slash about uh, slash grants underscore info. We will follow up with an email with that link. We're also going to mention it throughout the presentation quite a bit. Um, if you're a project lead, please do bookmark this. Uh, have it somewhere where you're going to be able to recall it in, let's say, eight or nine months, uh, where you may have a question about a report, or if you just need to write your semester status report um, in the spring, uh, have it right here. 
We have all these deadlines by semester. They even go all the way back to summer 2021. Um, they have fall. You're not going to have to worry about fall because it is in 10 days. Um, spring 2022 is the first semester status report date for you transformation folks. Uh, we are going to go over these dates again, but we've got it up to fall 2022. And as deadlines come into fall 2023, we're adding those two. They will always look pretty similar. Uh, it depends on the weekday. So August 16th in the summer of 2021, August 15th in 2022, December 20th this year, December 19th next year. It all depends on the workday. You've got all of your report templates here including their final report, the reporting guidelines, um, any platforms that you want to use for hosting, uh, resource, uh, resources to help you with OER research, and our kickoff training and our meeting recording. So we will have the round 21 right here. So that's the big important page is the grants info page. But there's other stuff to know about the site. For example, if you need any stats from your institution or overall about uh, what Affordable Learning Georgia has done and what the USG is doing. Um, this is the place for it. You've got the big numbers here. They update once a year spring. So spring 2022 is when we're going to see the next one here. Um, the ALG Data Center has way more information and they have institution specific reports. This will update for fall 2021 when we have all of that fall data. There's a Power BI dashboard that you could just view on the web. And it takes a little bit to load because it's quite powerful. And here is a whole data breakdown of spring 2021. This is all student savings by institution, by subject area, by academic year. Same thing for how many students are affected. Same thing for the total amount awarded to an institution. Uh, by subject area, by institution right here. So there's all kinds of stuff here. There's a flyer that we make that uh, feeds through um, this data, and this data is all on one big Excel file, and we have a copy of that Excel file right here. The institution reports are neat. If you go to one of these reports, and I'll open up uh, Georgia Gwinnett. I know we have a few Georgia Gwinnett folks with us today. Uh, here is the uh, affordable materials grants data for all time, total savings, total students affected, annual savings, annual uh, students affected. There's even a ranking where you are in all of our institutions for student savings and the number of students affected. Uh, grants awarded by subject area. And then we have all of the uh, materials designators. Uh, these are in the catalog. Uh, your um, Basically, when your students are signing up for sections through registration, they should be able to see if something is marked as a low cost section or a no cost section. Uh, that's all done through banner through the registration system. Georgia best takes care of all the technology part of it. And you can see uh, by subject area where the most no cost courses are and where the most low cost courses are. This excludes ECOR. So let's say that you uh, allow ECOR at your institution. ECOR has all OER for their core curriculum courses. Uh, it would be just a competition to see who, how, how many ECOR courses you had if that were the case. So we do non ECOR. So this shows you exactly what your institution is doing. So that's what you'll see here. These will be updated for fall. Um, they don't get updated for summer. Summer's kind of weird. Uh, a lot of people are not looking for summer data. And we have the final report summaries. This is more qualitative, and you'll see how your final reports are brought together into something meaningful uh, by the end of it, and we share these out. This goes all the way back to 2014 when we first got started. Uh, 2020's report, predictably enough, is Hey, look, it's a proposal. Let's bring that out of there. There we go. Let's try that again. Here we go. It is predictably a uh, COVID-19 heavy thing. With all the pandemic complications that have happened to teams in 2020, 
I would bet you that this will look a lot like what it does in 2021, sadly. Um, but there's all kinds of stuff here. The uh, overall student satisfaction measure that you'll be reporting, the overall student learning outcomes measure that you'll be reporting, and the course level overall retention, uh, meaning drop, fail, withdraw, or DF withdraw, along with lessons learned, plenty of quotes, uh, you know, things to keep in mind for a successful implementation. So our reports page, pretty cool. The other thing you'll want to look at is this open educational resources page. This has both places where we have our OER. Our older place is Galileo Open Learning Materials. That is all of our stuff all the way back to 2014. Open ALG is our newer place. We want to get all of our old stuff in there and we will with the help of a student soon enough, uh, but that is down the line. But OpenALG is kind of the new place, so I'm going to show you this. Runs off of something called Manifold. And because Manifold is a thing that ingests Word documents and uh, HTML documents into it and makes web readable textbooks out of it, we have a template. So I'm going to go all the way down here. There's welcome training. Here's the asynchronous kickoff training, the accessibility series. Uh, if I go back up, though, just search for template up here. Yeah, I spelled it wrong. Here we go. There is a single document word template in, in Manifold for this. You can download the entire guide for it or a blank template. And you can read the whole thing too. So here's the introductory information, how it works, the how to use titles and headings in Word to make it show up well. This is all just Word stuff. Here's a heading one, that's a heading two. This is a heading two, that's a heading one. Um, this structured text in, in your materials is really neat. Uh, I'm sure you've already seen some of this in the accessibility training, but making it more accessible in Word makes this far more accessible in Manifold, which I think is super neat. Um, you could search across all of the resources. So let's say I wanted to search for calculus. I would find a textbook, Armstrong Calculus, one of the earliest ones, one of our prototype manifold things that we did. Uh, ancillary videos for calculus. Here's Calculus 1 ancillary materials. Uh, calculus 1 homework for something called Infinity. And then you see all kinds of stuff that mentions calculus as well, but you'll also get stuff in the text. So let's say that I wanted to search for derivatives. Well, that sure is going to show up in a lot of calculus stuff. But <laughs> maybe I was using the wrong term. Because also derivative works will show up on things like the laboratory manual for introduction to geology, which has something about how to use derivative works. But just searching for a topic in here, you'll find things throughout all of OpenALG. Now you've already uh, gone through an asynchronous training that tells you about OER and there are plenty of places to find it. Uh, OpenStax has a great set of introductory materials and business materials. Um, the Open Textbook Library has a really nice curated uh, collection of textbooks. There are much bigger searches out there like the Mason OER MetaFinder, but uh, this one is just the home for all of our resources. They often will show up in places like the Open Textbook Library and uh, the Mason MetaFinder, but this is the home for this stuff. So I wouldn't just look here and then be like, well, Looks like there's no OER for me because this is just the USG created stuff. There's plenty more out there, but if you want to find the coolest, newest uh, open resources that the USG has created, OpenALG is the place for it. Galileo Open Learning Materials, very similar. Um, this is a place to search for stuff. You can browse all the open textbooks. Um, you can browse all of the grants collections, which are the old ways of us putting up reports. Um, browse any ancillary materials. You can see uh, some global stats, which is really nice. I'm from around Worcester, Mass. That's neat to see that in there. 
Um, so if you want to find older stuff that was created in the USG, for now I would go here. Later on, um, we will have all of that added to open ALG, which would be really nice. So those are the helpful things in Affordable Learning Georgia. Be sure that you bookmark the Grantee Information Center on the grants page. Um, you can always check your the, the stats. You can always check the final report summaries here. And then Open Educational Resources. This is the place where all of the USG stuff is hosted. We also have a newsletter. If you click on newsletter, you can join it. We have uh, Twitter. Um, our Galileo marketing person does really cool stuff with uh, transferring um, newsletter promotions and other promotions over to the uh, Twitter feed as well. Uh, there's a contact us form because your grantees just email us directly. Um, but if anyone's ever confused about anything and wants to hit the contact us button, that message will also get to us as well. And we'll just have to go through one channel of routing before it gets there, which is just Galileo proper. They're very good at that stuff. so. It won't be a problem. All right. That was a quick tour of Affordable Learning Georgia. Before we go on um, to the the introductory things and, and just take a quick little break, um, does anybody have any questions about the ALG website? Hey, Jeff, can you show us how to get to the Grantee Information Center again, please? Sure. Um, I'll just, oh wait, oh, I hit the wrong button. Let me go back to the screen. I'll go back in here. And it will load soon. There we go. Okay, so if you go to Affordable Materials Grants, that's everything in here. Uh, but the Grantee Information Center is listed right at the top of all these links. So you'll go in here and you'll see the page. We're also going to email you the link to it, and it's also going to be in these slides as well. We have some thin walls. If you're hearing some talking behind me, there is another meeting happening. Just a second. I am going back to the kickoff documents again because PowerPoint Live has just failed to recognize that I am using this file. Yes. There we go. Now it's preparing. Sorry about all that. OK, as you can see, this is a little bit uh, abbreviated from our usual thing. So what we're going to do is just take a 10 minute break. We'll get back here at 1.30 and we'll introduce ourselves and then we'll go on through the grant procedures and uh, and then adjourn once all of that stuff is done. Uh, so let's take a quick break. Uh, and be sure to get yourself some water, some coffee, stay hydrated, and uh, be prepared to introduce yourself when we get back. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everybody. All right, it is 1.30, uh, so we're just going to go right along to the groups and this is not going to be breakout groups the way that it says instead because we're not going to do breakout groups and in the interest of time um, first of all the asynchronous kickoff stuff i want to make sure that you've seen what's happened um, since you've taken it this kickoff site the first page has a padlet uh, that's right under first things first, get to know your cohort. This is where everybody can introduce themselves and you can all just read like exactly who it is that's on your team and you know who is in this entire 
round 20 cohort. It's really cool. Um, what I want to do uh, to make sure that we don't have like 70 introductions at you know, two or three minutes an introduction, which would wind up uh, at the end of the entire kickoff meeting is we'll just go uh, by project. So what we'll do is I'll, I'll say the uh, institution and the project lead and um, the uh, course and the project lead and whoever else is on the team can share things about that project, uh, introduce what's going to happen. And if at any point you hear something where you're like, whoa, we're working on something similar or we've done something like that. Um, absolutely reach out, uh, you know, in the chat, uh, send an email, something like that, because that would be really neat. All right, um, so first of all, I'm just going to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Jeff Gallant. I'm the program director of Affordable Learning Georgia. I've been working with ALG since it got started in 2014. Uh, I was a musician uh, who really loved Creative Commons stuff and became a librarian who also still liked Creative Commons stuff. And so when I became a reference librarian and someone asked me, hey, uh, could you head up this OER thing? I was like, yeah, absolutely. Open education is kind of right in my wheelhouse. So I've had a lot of fun uh, over the past seven years uh, running an initiative. Uh, so let's get started. Um, the first project that I'll do is from Clayton State University. It's a continuous improvement grant in uh, Education 3010, and the project lead is Latasha Adams. Hi, everybody. I'm Latasha Adams, like Jeff said, and I'm super excited for doing this. I am the middle grades coordinator at Clayton State University, and this project will allow me to transform um, the first course that all of the juniors take in middle grades. Um, the course is about adolescent learners and their development. And so I'm really excited to create some new materials for the course, um, to make the course more affordable for our students, because that is a challenge for one of our students. I mean, for not for one, for all of our students. Um, and so uh, that's the project. And I'm excited to um, work with any of you who have something similar in um, education, or if you have um, changed a course that deals with um, theories or anything in education. Is that what I'm supposed to do? Is that it? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else on the team want to talk about what they're doing? So I'm the only one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm working off of multiple Excel sheets here. Uh, okay, well, thank you. Um, next up is also from Clayton State. I'm going to go by institution on here. Uh, this is a continuous improvement grant uh, in the physics realm on 2211 and 2212, and the project lead is Dmitry Beznoska. Well, hey everyone, my name is Dmitry, so I'm the faculty member at Clayton State University. We've done the transformation grant this year. I'm still writing the report on it, and um, we did it on physics classes, and now we need to do the laboratories to go with it. So continuous improvement is going to help us uh, do this. Uh, we did some little experimentation this year uh, as to how to change that course, introduce some new ideas, uh, such as using of trackers, some online and uh, video-based labs, or where the two students take videos actually in the lab and analyze it using a computer instead of just using the usual sensors or other devices. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and actually change oral laboratories to, uh, to go with this model. Right? So if anybody uh, wants to know more, I do have some uh, preliminary material I can share, or if you want to join our work or have any questions, you're absolutely welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, our next one is from Columbus State University. It's a transformation grant in, um, in computer science, uh, 3105, 4155, 40, there's a lot. Um, and Lin Qiang, uh, that is you. Hey everyone, uh, this is uh, Lin Qiang uh, from uh, Columbus State University. I'm currently working as a assistant professor uh, in the School of Computer Science. For this grant, we have a very uh, kind of big team. We have five team members. Uh, we are going to transfer like five different 3,000 or 4,000 level courses to like 
uh, make like a design the, the cost materials, make uh, practical, uh, affordable for students, because we think that uh, those kind of high level, kind of high level classes will be, will should be, make, will should make it practical and advanced and catch up the newest technology. So that's why we, we want to, we plan to design the newest uh, materials uh, with more advanced and also affordable materials for students. And this not only can reduce the cost of the materials, the textbook, but also will be very benefit, beneficial for students to learn the newest and advanced technologies. Yeah, that's the overview for our project. Today we have, I have another uh, team member, my colleague, Dr. Yi Zhou is with me as well. Thank you. Oh, hello. All right, cool. Yeah, I, it's it's great that we have so many um, uh, different projects that happen in the computer sciences and IT. The great thing about it is that you're able to keep these up to date through your own updates, which is really neat. Uh, the tough thing is you got to keep them up to date. <laughs> uh, you can't. Uh, so it, it is definitely a, uh, a human effort here, which is really cool. All right, our next project uh, is from Georgia Highlands College. It's a transformation project and it's in history uh, 2500 and 2400. The project lead is Bronson Long. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Bronson Long from Georgia Highlands College, and uh, I have this grant with my colleague, Dr. Jamie Fagan, and we're really excited about this. We have two new classes that were recently approved. Uh, one is economic history, which I'll be teaching, and the other is medical history, which she'll be teaching. So we have uh, done a number of ALG grants in the past, and what we plan to do with this one is to make a series of short lecture videos. Mine will be economic history, hers obviously medical history, and we're going to do a couple of crossover videos that go both ways. So I'm going to do a history of medical insurance. She's going to do one on the uh, on the bubonic plague and how that affected trade and economies and so forth. So it's a very exciting project. We're also going to uh, have these in, as I mentioned, lecture form, but also PDF form for students who prefer to read. We also plan to build these, all these on uh, D2L, uh, not just the, the lecture videos and PDFs, but also all kinds of activities and ancillary materials and so forth. So uh, it'll be a really exciting a uh, OER project for brand new classes. Hey, I'm Jamie Fagan. I'm working with Bronson on this project. My uh, the webcam on my external monitor is on the fritz, so I can't share my screen or show you what I look like. I did add it into the Padlet, um, but at this point in the semester, I cannot stare at the tiny little laptop screen anymore. <laughs> so we're just gonna have to, to deal with it. Anyway, like Bronson said, we're super excited to be working with digital media services, kind of bringing in another side of the house on these videos and using the principles of universal design for learning to hopefully take a new approach to economic and medical history. Nice to meet you guys. Yeah, good great, to meet you. great to meet you, uh, Dr. Long, and uh, great to see you as always, uh, Dr. Fagan. You've been uh, really great at leading quite a few of these projects. Um, all right, so at Georgia Southern, and there is a big Georgia Southern turnout um, this time around in these grants. Uh, this is a transformation project in Poli Sci 4031. Uh, the project lead is Delanda Roy. I'm not Nalanda, but I'm working with her. Maybe she's. Oh, OK, out. cool. <laughs> yeah, I do not see her in here. So I can briefly kind of go over what we're doing. Sure, sure. So I'm Vivian Bino. I'm a librarian at Georgia Southern, and we are going to develop a library guide to use as a no cost resource for students um, with the human rights course. There's not a really good textbook that you can be up to date with with all the uh, current events going on in that area. 
So this will be a great way for us to um, utilize library guides, which so many people already use um, as a resource for that. And we're really excited about it. Excellent. Um, also, Georgia Southern uh, continuous improvement grants in uh, computer size 3230 and 3236 uh, is. Let me see. Yep, Wei Tong Tong. Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Wei Tian Tong. Um, this is a project uh, collaborate with uh, Dr. Li Xin Li, also from our department. So this um, this is a, an improvement project. So in 2019, we uh, transformed the course, pro uh, course materials for a data structure class and theoretical foundation classes. But later, um, we have the COVID, right? So the course de de delivery mode changed a lot. So we try to uh, add more uh, hands-on coding examples and uh, some interactive course materials so help students to achieve uh, better self-paced learning eff effectiveness. Yeah, basically that's about our project. All right. Um, at Georgia Southern, we've got a transformation project in chemistry, 3401 and 3402. Uh, Christine Whitlock. Hi, I'm Christine Whitlock, I'm Georgia Southern University, a professor in organic chemistry, and my co-PI is Dr. Shanaz Lange, who is also in organic chemistry. And these these this grant affects organic chemistry one and two. And we have had received previous ALG grants to generate or develop OER textbook and an OER lab techniques book for the laboratory. This time, what we've decided we're, we're going to help develop a an online homework system using the learning management system and using the quizzes and supplement that with Lightboard videos. We have been requiring our students to do online homework and we negotiated a price and the company has removed our discount. And so we've decided to help the students out. And so we're going to work this spring and summer developing quizzes for online homework that all of the students taking organic will be required to do. Uh, let's go over uh, to you, Shainaz. Uh, you are uh, heading up the Chem 4160 and 7090 project as well. Oh, you're on mute. Hello, everybody. I'm Shanaz Lange from Georgia Southern University, and I am leading this time the project on forensic chemistry course. Uh, this course, after many, many years of a gap, um, uh, uh, we have started it again. So uh, my all, all my team is over here, uh, Dr. Sargent, Dr. Ghosh, and our library liaison. And what we are trying to do is we are trying to develop an OER content for the forensic chemistry course aligned with course-based undergraduate research experience. We, in, in that uh, aspect, we are going to create supplementary material in terms of case studies, techniques, demo videos, uh, which will align with the course material and uh, further can be used uh, for any departmental needs, whoever teaches the forensic chemistry uh, course. And we are also planning to publish this on a university libguide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. okay. Oh, oh. All right. Oh, so, so, oh, I think, uh, Shainaz, I think that you're uh, your microphone is reading the speaker. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so let's go to uh, another transformation project in a field that we have not yet seen um, in any transformation project up until this point. It's fashion uh, and design. It's uh, so let's bring in Addie Martindale. Hi, I'm Addie Martindale, um, also for Georgia Southern. Me and my um, um, colleague Virginia Roll, Dr. Virginia Rowling, are both in the Fashion Merchandising and Apparel Design Program at Georgia Southern, and we are transform transforming to the two intro classes that we have, which is Fashion Fundamentals and Social Psychological Aspects of Clothing. One of the reasons we want, the main reasons we want to eliminate cost 
but there's some other problems that we are facing. The fashion industry moves faster than publications can keep up with. So we're constantly updating things and talking about things in a textbook then saying, but this has changed now. And another problem we face is there's not a diverse representation of varied populations in the materials. The fashion industry really struggles with inclusiveness. Um, so we're going to develop our materials through LibGuides so that our courses are one, no cost, two, um, up to date, and three, reflect a diverse population. That's really cool. Thank you so much. Um, okay, let's go to uh, Nancy Remler, who has a has four different courses in two different uh, in two different subject cl uh, classifications. Hi, y'all. I'm Nancy Rimler from Georgia Southern. I am a team leader joined with my colleague Janelle Smith and Heather Scott, who's not with us today. Uh, we're from the College of Education at Georgia Southern, and those of you who are in the field of education are familiar with the TEKS rubric. And it, for pre-service teachers, we call it the intern keys rubric, which lists 10 standards that teachers need to meet for certification. Our project seeks to create original content that would align directly with those state rubrics to best prepare our pre-service teachers for certification. We're gonna work on two standards for this round, standards nine and 10, which address professionalism and communication because those are the standards that get assessed across the uh, degree programs. And because all state teachers need to comply with this rubric, we're able to apply our project to four courses in our program. But then once we make this content available, all pre-service teachers in the state of Georgia will benefit from them. That's really cool. Um, yeah, thank you, yeah. Oh, hi, Tanya. Uh, so I I think I just changed the permissions on sharing stuff, so I think we should be okay uh, with anyone being um, blocked from camera or microphone, but I, I hope that that works out. Um, at Georgia Southern, we have uh, a couple of others, too. Uh, transformation project in, uh, I believe this is physics too as well, um, Donna Molinax. Yes, um, so I'm working with a couple of colleagues out of the College of Health Professions, Lori Adams and Chanel McGee. Our goal is to create a physical science 1211 to be free. Um, and then also connect it with the students coming into their programs. About 40% of our students go into the College of Health Professions. Um, and so we want to, like it's been previous said, that area is constantly changing and the textbooks can't keep up. And there's really not a great textbook in general for the course. So to make it affordable and to keep it up with the changes that are helping in like ultrasound and sonography in those areas as well. Physical science, of course. I was looking at PHSC. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, those were, this is the last course that we have to make it free. So we're pretty excited. In the, or at least that on the Armstrong campus, all of our courses will be free. So that's excellent. All right. Um, and last one from Georgia Southern. Uh, a lot of Georgia Southern today. Um, and this is in chemistry in 1310 continuous improvement grant uh, from Dr. Narendra Parapu. Hello, everyone. I'm Bula Narendra Parapu. I'm the coordinator for Chem 1310, which is an introductory course for engineering majors. Um, as part of round 13, our team developed a um, LibGuide textbook. It's basically um, a curated resource of OpenStax and YouTube videos, which we hosted um, a LibGuide, and that serves currently as our chemistry textbook for the Chem 1310 course. Uh, um, Chem 1310 course is basically principles of Chem 1 and principles of Chem 2, two semesters of material. Uh, taught in just one semester. And most textbooks are written from a two semester perspective. Uh, so right now, um, our condensed version of um, the textbook serves as the textbooks for the one semester course. So 
Next year, I and my team, uh, um, our ALG champions from the university, Debbie Walker, uh, Nikki Cannon Rich, and our library liaison, Jeff Gallant, we are uh, developing ancillary materials, which are basically uh, self assessment tests for each chapter and going to host them on the LibGuide resource. We are also going to perform an assessment of how students use these resources and best ways to encourage students to use them. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Rich noticed that uh, there is some sort of noise going on in the background here. Sorry about that if you hear that, that is just building noise here. Uh, this is my one day in the office. I have usually two days a week uh, just being here in uh, the Athens location. Um, so that's that's what's going on. I wish I had a cat in this room, but no, unfortunately, no. Um, so uh, we have at Kennesaw State um, a transformation grant in sociology uh, from Daniel Farr. Is anyone from the project in here? I think he was not able to make it today. OK, yeah, I remember there was some sort of schedule clash there, so that's fine. I'll be uh, they'll be looking at the recording of this at that point. Um, yep, yeah, so we have a continuous improvement from Kennesaw. Um, I believe this is in linguistics, uh, Dr. Johnson. Yes, hello, I'm David Johnson from Kennesaw State, and my grant deals with looking at my history of the English language course, and I will be updating the materials. I've tried to use low cost materials, but I needed to upgrade that quite a bit, and I also use part of the grant to have various voice actors read my lectures in various dialects because it goes well with the whole theme of linguistics and dialects within the history of English. So that is my project. Yeah, I thought the voiceover idea was really cool. That's that's really neat. Um, a continuous improvement grant for many IT courses, uh, Dr. Shariar. Hi, my name is Don Privatera. I'm uh, representing our group. Uh, Dr. Sharir had a uh, uh, an appointment that he had to run to, uh, so he, he sends his regrets. But I'm uh, standing it for him. Yeah, we have four courses that we're going to be working on accessibility uh, on and to make these courses more available to uh, students uh, in particular. <clears throat> uh, to, you know, to make sure that uh, you know they're they're, they're readable and and uh, you know got the proper contrast and um, all all of those uh, you know all of the uh, images are annotated properly uh, so that you know folks who are using assistive uh, technologies are able to and you know enjoy and and be a part of uh, the course material. So we're, we've got uh, four classes. One of them's a web design class. Uh, we have a uh, human computer uh, interaction class, uh, an ethical hacking class, and a data communications and networking class that we're we're going to be uh, focused on, um, you know, boosting the uh, uh, accessibility for. Uh, our team consists of uh, uh, Bill Forsyth, um, of course, uh, Hossein, uh, Rich Halstead, um, and myself, and then um, uh, Garina. Uh, Banerjee is going to be assisting us uh, as well um, in uh, uh, helping us get it to all of the uh, all those courses kind of up to snuff, so to speak. Thanks so much. Um, let's go uh, over to Tanya Link, uh, who should be ready to introduce the sociology project.
Sorry, a little bit of a technical thing there. Oh. Yep. Oh, OK, someone's got control of the presentation. Sorry about that. You just want to hit your camera and your microphone uh, up at the top. Although if you are on a Mac, this may be a little different. Oh, OK, it's a Mac. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, yeah, the, the problem is that if I don't let people present, often what will happen is anyone who joins that isn't using the original email address that they're invited in won't be able to do anything. Uh, so that's why <laughs> there's rights to share uh, going on. Microsoft Teams is a little weird like that. Uh, but yeah, uh, Dr. Ling, if you want to introduce um, your project over chat, that's totally fine by me. Uh, once that gets there, we can uh, we can read it here. Uh, OK, so um, we also have another IT project at Kennesaw State, um, and, and it is from Dr. Lei Li. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, of, first of all, I just want to give you a. Uh, uh, actually, my name is Lei Li. Um, I'm the interim chair for the Department of IT, also a professor in IT. Uh, first, I just want to give you a big background on our effort as a department for the ALG. We are part of ALG since round one. So now uh, we are at round 20. And very excited that starting this fall, all our undergrad and graduate courses are Z degrees. In other words, zero textbook degree. We're very proud of what we have done and uh, very appreciative the support from the ALG office. So without your support, this cannot be happening. Um, so for round 20, uh, we, the, our department have two projects. The first one done, already talked about that. The second one, also four courses. And we have a strategic plan to gradually update the content of each course in our undergrad and graduate program. Um, as you know, the IT is very dynamic field. Uh, things, new things, new technology came up every day. And it's it, it become a part of our operation to keep that updating our curriculum. Uh, we may modify existing course, we may remove an old course, or add new courses. Uh, they're just part of our life. Uh, for this particular grant, we're going to work on four courses. Three of them are already transformed by ALG. And we're going to just update the content with new topics and also make sure that they are uh, DLI are compliant. Uh, for the third, for the fourth course, actually it's going to be completely redesigned. So there's going to be a lot of new development involved. Uh, we are uh, very excited to get the support from the ALG and I look forward to work uh, on the project. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, over at Savannah State, uh, we've got a psychology and somewhat sociology project with Dr. Sherry Sertikoff. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, OK, great. Sorry, I didn't have my stuff on. We had graduation this morning, so we're uh, we're uh, Getting here, I'm not sure if my colleagues are on. Hi, I'm Sherry Sertikoff. Uh, I'm the program coordinator for the behavior analysis program at Savannah State. Um, and uh, in our curriculum, we include psychology um, courses as well. And in this project, I'm actually we're actually co uh, collaborating with a colleague in sociology. So my colleagues, Dr. Stephanie Alexander um, in sociology, Kim Frame in behavior analysis, and I, along with the director of our Center for Teaching and Faculty Development, um, Dr. Nancy Linden, the four of us are going to um, take a use as a model. Some of you may be familiar with the psych pilot project that was conducted last year to to look at using Waymaker materials in introductory psychology. And so our project is essentially an extension of that. I participated in that. We're just wrapping that up. 
uh, now, and we're going to extend that model to our introduction to sociology class, Social 1101, the um, human growth and development class, Psych 2103, and then an upper level psychology class, Abnormal Psychology class. So our, our goal is to adapt all three of those classes so that the cost will be $25 per student, which is down substantially from textbooks for those classes that have been in use. And the secondary goal that we have is to design the classes with a similar form and structure in mind, as many students take all of those classes. And so to provide some consistency in terms of our delivery uh, of courses and with not only the accessibility standards that we're required uh, to have as part of this project, but also more general uh, quality matters standards. So um, we've become more heavily involved in quality matters this year. And since the delivery will be through D2L, uh, we're looking at, although the classes won't be limited to online format, uh, some of those general qualities, uh, those general uh, standards for quality matters uh, are really applicable for any sort of uh, project we think. And so uh, we are looking to do that. So I'm not sure if, I'm pretty sure Nancy Linden said she couldn't be here. I'm not sure if Stephanie and Kim have made it. I'm, I'm here. Ah, there she is. Okay, Steph. Hi. Let me get my <laughs> camera on there. <laughs> it was rough getting in today. I don't know why, but it was it was rough today. But hello there. Here I am. Hello. 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 Okay, and I, I think Kim is is maybe in transit. So. Well, thank you very much. It's really cool to see um, things from that pilot project uh, coming to be a new project altogether. That's really neat. All right, um, from University of Georgia, we have a continuous improvement uh, project uh, with Dr. Bridget Garner. Hi there, my name Hello. is Bridget. My name is Bridget Garner. I'm an associate professor of clinical pathology at the College of Veterinary Medicine for the University of Georgia. Um, my co-authors and I are all veterinary clinical pathologists. And as part of that role, we're responsible for teaching laboratory medicine and diagnostic pathology to veterinary students. And VPAT 5400 the course that we wrote the grant proposal for is a core course, so all veterinary students have to take that before they graduate. The goal of our project is to develop case-based ancillary materials to go along with eclinpath.com. That's an OER for our field, of which there are very, very few. And so we're gonna develop these ancillary materials to be used in small group discussions with third and fourth year clinical rotation veterinary students. Excellent, thanks so much. Uh, as someone who uh, has a dog and always thinks about uh, the UGA vet school because they're one of the cool places that a lot of the vets come from. Uh, uh, it, it's really neat to have uh, you involved in ALG. Uh, now from UNG, uh, from University of North Georgia, uh, we have a, a very upper level course up in the 7,000s um, with Catherine Rose Adams. Uh, greetings, I'm Catherine Rose Adams. I'm an assistant Hello. professor and program coordinator at the University of North Georgia um, for the Higher Education Leadership and Practice Doctoral Program. Um, we, like many of you have heard so far, uh, are transforming six of our courses into no cost or low cost options, um, four of them being no cost and two uh, low cost. Our focus is, is really similar to what Dr. Martindale had already said. Um, 100% of our students are working adults. 
Um, and so the cost is a really important option for them. But for us, it's also to make sure that we're continuing. Sorry, I got strapped this week. That we're continuing to have um, yeah, diverse voices at the table and being presented as well as contemporary um, readings that they have the opportunity to truly apply as they're working. Um, we plan on utilizing Galileo, making sure it's within our home network because it's higher education. So many of our students work at other higher education institutions, which may have some access that others don't. So we have to really be mindful about what access means while you're a student at our program, it's accessible to everyone, as well as continue to use open access materials that are available to them in, um, in, in other ways to, to keep that contemporary uh, voice there. Um, we're going to modify two courses a semester between spring, summer, and fall, so we're going to be busy all next year um, and pretty excited to do so. Uh, myself and uh, Dr. Lanford, we are two of three faculty in our whole program. Our third one just came on um, a few months ago uh, to our surprise of being when we submitted our grant, um, and so we're excited because for us, we think this is a start um, to see if we can actually evolve our entire program to be low or no cost. Thank you so much. That's a valiant sharing of a lot of information for having strep throat. Uh, over at West Georgia, we have three projects. Uh, we're going to start with the transformation one of marketing um, from Dr. Trelkowska. Hi, my name is Agnieszka Trelkowska. Okay. And I'm originally from Poland. I'm an assistant professor of marketing uh, at UWG, and I will be. Um, creating a no-cost textbook for our advertising class, which is uh, a mandatory class for all our marketing majors and minors. So I'm looking forward to that. I will not be working with a colleague. However, I will be employing some students. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to you know, collaborating with them and getting their feedback um, to offer this, no -cost, this course as a no-course for our majors. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also at UWG uh, is a mathematics one from Dr. James Bella. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. Um, my, my, name, my name is Jim Bella, and um, we are putting to, well, I, actually, it's me, myself. Um, I'm going to be creating um, a free textbook for the uh, Math 1401 uh, elementary stats course. Um, and the idea behind that is to, well, one is to get, you know, a, a, a free um, ebook, e um, open source book, because the book that we've been using, textbook was pretty expensive. Um, and also, um, what I'm going to be doing is um, uh, get, get, getting some feedback from, from the students in, 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 in the course. To see um, see what what they would like to see in in a, in a book and materials, other types of materials to go along with that um, supporting materials, and also the uh, the the data because a lot of our students are from the the uh, nursing majors and other um, and the, and the, and the uh, uh, social sciences. So um, I'm going to be um, um, surveying them and seeing what types of data they're interested, in, even if it's not from their major, if it's just 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 kind of fun data. So we're going to put um, kind of hi highlight the those types of that type of data and go out and find um, sort of some real data, some real uh, and, and current data um, in the, in those areas, so that the students, as they're reading the book and they're seeing, instead of just some some numbers that came out and you know some random thing, that they have have something like, oh, hey, th th this is really cool. I'm, I'm what I want to see what what this data t says, or you know what they see in, in that in that data, and it's, it's a little bit more meaningful for them. Yeah, thank you. That's a cool way of boosting relevance uh, for students. And I feel like in a lot of student assessments of any materials that they're using, the relevance to themselves and their lives and their futures, uh, all of that uh, really lines up with what they think is a high quality resource. Um, over at UWG, we also have um, an education one, and this is from Dr. Elizabeth Pope. OK, hello. Um, hello. Marsha Simon, so I'm representing the team. So we're a team consisting of 
um, two, uh, three educational research faculty and one special education faculty. So we teach the, it's a free course special education series, research series where students develop or they design a, re a single subject research study. They go in, they collect the data and then they report that. So the course, we're revising the first sequence of the course. The materials are a bit outdated. So that's the goal of the grant is for us to update the resources in there and provide some new ones. And we're also trying to see if we could get an e-textbook that they could use that wouldn't cost anything for them. Because right now there are no costs. Um, they don't use a textbook, so everything, all the materials are. So that's, we're just in the whole goal of this grant is to update the course and to make it more, what did I say, more, more, more updated. The, what do we have yeah. in there? It's outdated. Sounds really good. Um, at Valdosta State University, we have two physics projects. Um, they are both continuous improvement ones. Uh, let's hear first from Dr. Moop. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hi, um, so I'm Shafat. Um, my project is uh, developing online lectures, video lectures for Inter Physics 1. So um, the uh, plan is to uh, I generally use slides, PowerPoint slides for my lecture. So um, over the pandemic, I've been recording them. So now my plan is to record a full set of lectures, post them on um, an online platform that will allow students or instructors to use them as well. So that's my project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, uh, from, also from, oh, oh, would you mind going back on mute, Dr. Uh, Move in, it's uh, echoing back. Dr. Move in, it's uh, echoing. Here we go. Um, OK, uh, also from Dr. Chakraborty, um, who is doing a physics project as well. Hello, my name is Shantanu Chakraborty. I'm an phys uh, assistant physics professor at Valdosta State University. I'm also you know, doing a continuous development uh, project on physics uh, 2211. It's the introductory physics one course for the calculus based uh, physics classes. And uh, over the pandemic, uh, I've been recording and uploading, you know, uh, my lectures, uh, especially starting from fall of uh, sort of summer of 2020. So I thought of like, uh, why don't I, you know, save these lectures, uh, um, remodify them, and also as well as, you know, update some of those existing uh, homeworks, uh, recitation problems, and other. Uh, supporting materials because it has been a uh, thing like more than uh, four, probably like five years since we did that original project, textbook, textbook transformation project on this one. Thank you. Thank you. So we have so many different kinds of projects, very diverse range of subjects. We go all the way from 1000 to 7000 level courses. Um, there are projects that are directed towards making the abstract old mathematics relevant and we have projects that are updating uh, computer science to the absolute newest technology. Uh, so we, we are running all of all around the board uh, on this in this cohort. It's, it's a really neat uh, group of projects that I think are going to be impactful in ways uh, that are more than just cost savings. They're, there are a lot of projects, even when they say, hey, we're saving students a lot of money, uh, there are still really cool materials and uh, different ways of teaching and learning that are coming out of these. It's it's a real inspiring group. Uh, I, I hope you think so, as you've heard everyone speak. So the next thing that we're going to do is take an actual 15 minute break. Now we're going to collect ourselves and then we're going to talk about paperwork. Once we're done talking about paperwork, there is not much else to do. Um, just uh, a walkthrough of the final report. Uh, that's kind of part of the whole thing. Uh, just a, a quick intro to what the listserv is, and then we'll be all done. So let's reconvene here at 2.30, and we'll go over all of that paperwork stuff, uh, and I'll see you then.
Hello everyone, it is 2.30, so we are going to continue. Um, and this is going to be kind of my presentation part. And uh, much like uh, someone who just presented, I've got a problem going on while I'm speaking. Uh, my sinuses are having some real issues. So if at any point I just wind up muting, it's to stop the sinus noise for a second and uh, then I'll keep going. Uh, so we're going to talk mostly about grant procedures in this next part. So funding is not the same as you would expect from an external grant, uh, an NSF grant or an NIH grant. It's not a direct stipend given to team members. Uh, this funding goes to the institution. The institution then covers the team members time for this project uh, because that project is included in the statement of work and also project expenses and any travel expenses that are needed, although Travel expenses are mostly just registration for virtual conferences uh, in 2021 for sure. Uh, covering team members time really depends on the institution. And this will be something that may pop up as you wind up with questions. There are a lot of things that your institution is going to be able to mediate a lot better than I am, uh, mostly because they have their own policies on how exactly um, something like release time or overload pay works at your institution. Sometimes those do not qualify for particular contracts. It all depends on where you are. Uh, so when uh, funding is distributed, it's distributed at the beginning and then at the end. So 50% once the uh, service level agreement is completely agreed upon between the institution and the legal folks over at uh, the USG. Um, either of these can take a little while and we'll get into the process in a bit here. Uh, but once all of that is done and signed, we can pay the first invoice from your institution and that funding is distributed. Um, the second half of the funding is on submission of the final report at the end. Now, how this is managed, once again, depends on your institution. Um, some institutions present all of the money up front as part of the budget, and that works uh, pretty well for them uh, running a line of credit. Of course, if the project isn't finished, then there has to be things like remitting unused funds and discussions, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so they do take a bit of risk on in doing that, but uh, other institutions will not do that. Uh, they will wait until uh, the invoice is sent in and we send in the funding. Um, there is no right or wrong answer as to how that all works. It sometimes has to do with the institution's composition, how many people are involved in the grants office. Um, sometimes the bigger grants offices actually take longer with this stuff, partially because they just have a long queue of things to do, and partially because service level agreements are not what they're used to when they get funding from nonprofits and such. Uh, so a little bit of patience goes a long way when it comes to this uh, on my end as well, for sure. Now, the reason why this happens is because there's a lot more flexibility if we have an agreement with the institution um, and, of course, by nature with the team. Uh, let's say that someone in your department leaves and you have somebody else who wants to come in. If there are individual stipends being given out, that gets very complicated very quickly. But you being able to introduce somebody else into the group uh, just as fast as saying, yeah, absolutely, they'll, they'll join. Uh, that works really well. Uh, it also has to do with uh, the amount of compensation versus the replacement of teaching load. Um, it has to do with timing a lot of the time. It, it, there's a lot of reasons why having an agreement with your institution as opposed to having an agreement where it's just individual stipends winds up being more flexible, uh, especially that you're able to, for the most part, repurpose funds should something not work out. Let's say that you have been evaluating three different mathematics uh, software platforms 
and you were planning on purchasing one of them, and it turns out that one just doesn't work for you. You want to go with this other one. There would be a line item change in, uh, in a more direct grant that does not have this kind of agreement behind it, but with a service level agreement, you're able to shift that very quickly um, and mostly just through your institution. Uh, so yeah, that's how it goes. And the 50%, 50% disbursement is kind of a standard among any of these service level agreement grants that the USG does, uh, not just within ALG, but within other organizations as well. And it's just an accountability measure there. So the first thing to do and this is why we have you fill out a form with your business or grants office, or at least your financial contact in the department if you have one, um, is that you really need to know who to contact about this, because these, pro these processes are very much centered around what your institution can do. We send the funding, but from there, the institution really takes it on. They need to know a couple of things. Uh, first of all, they are allocations of state funds uh, for the implementation and creation of affordable resources. Most places will not follow the federal and external guidelines that uh, come in when it when they get indirect funding and it's paying for facilities and administration and all that stuff, um, unless it is that kind of funding. Some places, they still follow the external policies. It's really up to them. I, I cannot uh, influence them one way or another on how they conduct their grants or business office. Um, so if I were able to tell you here is exactly how uh, funding works at um, at every institution, I, I totally would. But it is more about getting to know your business and grants office when it comes to this for that reason. And we don't do indirect costs. Now, a lot of people when they see indirect costs, they think, oh, anything that doesn't have to do directly with my uh, salary or directly with expenses. But that's not really the case. Uh, direct costs includes fringes. Uh, so for example, if you're going to be given um, a certain amount of funding through your payroll, uh, there are fringes that immediately have to be covered because of that. So uh, some grants and business offices will figure those fringes in immediately. Those are not indirect costs. Those are the costs associated with paying for your time. Um, indirect costs would be facilities and administration or F and A. Uh, the kind of things where it's like you're not our organization and yet you're paying for work to be done here. So help us keep the lights on. With the USG, we're all in the same organization, so that kind of stuff does not happen. And of course, this is exactly why we had you discuss your proposal with your office before submitting that stuff to us. So you know that point of contact. Uh, you'll need it a couple of times during this project. And this all works through a service level agreement um, between the system office and the institution. Uh, the signature process is not overly complicated, but here's uh, what you'll need to know. First of all, um, there are kind of four big sections to the service level agreement. And if you were in one of the older rounds before about a year ago, this is going to look a little bit different to you. There's a lot less whereas and uh, therefores in there, and there's a lot more getting into the details of what these kinds of grants are and what can happen in the event of a weird thing that happens within just these grants. Um, but the first part is just saying your proposal uh, is the statement of work. That's why we really make sure that some of you, if we ask you for clarifications, that those were on the proposal. We brought those revised proposals uh, over and those will be used in the SLA. So the corrected versions are the ones that are going. Um, yeah, and so that works as the thing that's referred to in this agreement as the work that needs to get done. And that includes here's who's on the team. That also includes here's what's going to happen. Here's our timeline, our budget, et cetera. It's the most important part of this agreement because it is individually the thing that makes your project unique. Um, if someone has to leave the team, definitely work uh, with your institution on assigning another person to that role if it applies. 
uh, let us know in the semester status report. You don't have to reach out to us and be like, uh, is it OK if we add, add somebody in? Yes, it's absolutely OK. We know that turnover happens and that's part of the SLA uh, is what would happen in the event of that kind of turnover. The next section is the starting and ending dates. Uh, these are not March 6, 2021, of course. This was the previous round, uh, but keep an eye on the start date and the end date. Um, if you said that your um, that your final semester was one semester and it's not that semester on the SLA, uh, that's especially for continuous improvement grant folks who have two options. Be sure to let me know before you go off and get it signed. We can fix it very easily here before that stuff gets signed. But if we do it after it gets signed, we got to get it re-signed because here's an entirely new thing. Um, so don't worry about the dates on this slide. We will fix those before we get it sent in. But yes, uh, be sure to check all of the dates when we send the service level agreement your way. The next part is about the project funding and how it works. Um, this is the stuff that you've already seen in the RFP. This is the stuff that I've explained in some ways, things like indirect costs to knock out. All of that stuff is in there. Um, there's not much that you need to check here, but be sure to check the award amount. That's pretty important. And uh, your date and your final semester. Just make sure that all of the timing is correct. Now this is the new one, uh, something that you hadn't seen on previous service level agreements, but will be here on this one um, unless you were in round 18 or 19. This is the contingency section or the what if stuff goes wrong section. It is very rare that something will go wrong enough to actually apply to what's going on in the service level agreement, but it has happened before. So if something is going this way, if it's really looking like something's up, contact us as soon as you can so that we can work together on finding out a solution uh, as soon as possible. So for example, if your project's only partially completed by the deadline, let's say you're on the team and then someone else just disappears and it doesn't get completed and there, there was work that was done but it's not going to be finished by the end. Uh, let us know immediately. And, and the first thing that we'll see is if there are any alternatives uh, in getting it done. Does it just need a semester delay? We could amend it at that point. Uh, does it just need somebody else to join the team and they're, they're willing? Well, you can totally do that. That's great. If there's no way forward, then we just work out what happens past that point. Usually uh, that would mean that the second half of the funds, if work was already done, but it won't be complete by the end, maybe the second half of the funds don't wind up getting there because there wasn't work on that second half. But it's proposal by proposal. There could be a thing where 80% of that work is done and a lot more work got done at the end. And it, 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 it gets very, uh, we basically cannot make it too direct. We can't put a number on this section or a percentage on this section because circumstances are what they are, especially during the pandemic. Um, so yeah, if your project has zero work done, if nothing ever happened, if there's nowhere, no way to fix it, we can recover those funds that haven't been used to complete the work. Uh, some of this gets a little bit scary looking because it is in the event of weird, rare things happening. But just know that those events are weird and they are rare. And if they do happen, then we will absolutely treat it case by case as a weird, rare thing here too. Uh, we'll work with you on this. Be sure that your institution doesn't just suddenly act on it without contacting us first. Um, there have been, there was only one case and you've seen your three digit number or your uh, M three digit number. You know how many applications and probably how many projects have gone through this by now. Um, we had one case where the institution just sent the funds back, all of them, including things that had been used already. And we went, whoa, wait a minute, but the deed was already done. So be sure that if something is going wrong, get in contact with us. If 
your business office sees something going wrong, have them get in contact with us because more often than not, there is an easy fix. There is it, it should never really get to the point where there's you know zero work being done and there's disputes over funds or something like that. Um, yeah, weird and rare things. We can work with you on that for sure. Now the rest are just regular things that happen in an agreement. Um, number five is just an agreement that says that uh, the institution can't ask for more money than they were awarded, can't ask for, for credit from the state. That's just something that is in every single contract. Uh, number six, uh, if the agreement is somehow or suddenly outside of the federal or state laws, those laws prevail over our agreement. Another thing that, that's so rare that nothing has ever happened like that before. Uh, number seven is an anti-discrimination clause. Uh, number eight is uh, just saying that we need an agreement from both parties and it is able to be modified. So like if we need an amendment, uh, some things just get delayed. You know, COVID-19 is still causing trouble next year. Um, we can uh, delay things a semester or two. Um, and also number nine is just stating that both parties agree and the contract needs to be completed in a timely manner. Uh, that's the time is of the essence wording that you'll see in a lot of contracts. It, it just means things need to move forward pretty quickly. So here's how it works. First, we draft the SLAs. Um, we wait a little bit in between the acceptance of the awards and sending out the SLAs. It's usually after the kickoff meeting, not like after like 3 p.m. today, but about Tuesday next week you should see uh, the service level agreements and what I'll do is send them to you first so that you can check them and I'll give you a, a quick deadline probably be about a week um, then after that I'm going to distribute these SLAs to the uh, business and grants office contacts at your institution um, I'm going to use DocuSign hopefully uh, that makes things quicker Every so often, uh, an institution just cannot use DocuSign for some reason. In that case, we just won't do it that way. Um, the business and grants offices will sign it and they'll send it back to us. Uh, what's great about DocuSign is that if somebody gets a contract and they forget about it and it's been a week, it'll send them a thing saying, hey, yeah, this contract you need to sign. So we don't have to manually check in uh, with, with those folks. They will get uh, a reminder every so often about it. So the contracts have come back to us from the institution. What happens next? Well, this is where I do a lot of work. Uh, so I take that signed service level agreement, and if it's locked as a PDF, I have to unlock it. Uh, sometimes it's so locked that I have to get people to unlock it themselves. Um, because I need to add some documents to it. I put a routing form. That's where it tells the contract to go. Um, it also allows for our executive director, Lucy Harrison, to sign off on it. Then it gets sent over through the business office as a requisition, which means that I have now secured the funds for the project. I have sent it over to legal. Now, this is the point where things get very opaque. Um, where I might not know where it is and the business office may not know where it is and it is just in the queue for legal or legal is looking it over and they have a question but they're going to ask somebody else about it. They ask that person, it takes them a while, they get back, then they're like, okay, we have a question and they're like, oh, all right, let's talk about it. So then we talk about it, then they sign it, then it goes to the business office, the business office signs it, then it goes back to me. Uh, so that whole part is just a communication chain and there is no one software that uh, tracks all of that. I wish I could just send it through DocuSign and it would go business office and then here, but we got to put it in e-procurement first. So the business office has their own DocuSign that they send to legal and then legal has their own procedures outside of DocuSign to do it before it gets signed. So it's kind of like I send the SLAs to you, the SLAs come back from the institution, I send it over to get signed something, and then I get it back and I send it right back to you. Uh, so 
I will send the fully executed SLAs uh, to the business and grants offices because they always need that fully executed copy. Uh, and I will include you on those emails too. Now we can check with the business office on where something is in the system, but uh, we can't check on legal on their signature status. So the business office can only go so far in seeing where this is. Uh, being the holiday break, things might get stalled a bit. Um, the signature process is exactly that. I mean, it, it is a human activity and humans will be out of the office for a little while. Um, so let me know if something is held up way too long um, or even mid too long or even eh, I don't know about this. This is a little longer than usual and we will check on it. We'll, we'll reach out. So after all that and we get the fully signed service level agreement, sending it out to you, um, we can then pay the first invoice for half of the award amount. Um, they, this invoice is not an expense report. It's not something that you can print out from PeopleSoft or anything like that. It is an invoice document that is sent from the business or grants office at your institution to us. It's got the letterhead on there. It's got an invoice number. It's got a date. Um, that's the only way that we can pay it. I've seen some expense reports come in before, these big spreadsheets full of things that you've done. That is an institutional document and not ours. Uh, we just need the institution's invoice sent to us. We send it over to accounts payable to be paid. Uh, there has to be two signatures on that before it gets to them, but we are very quick at that part. Uh, accounts payable, uh, as, as you might imagine, has a lot of invoices to pay. And most of the time, they do these within one to two weeks. Uh, every so often, it does not take that long. It, it goes further than that. Um, if your institution just hasn't received the funds after they've sent an invoice, uh, check in with me. What I can do is go right to our admin so we know exactly when we signed it and sent it over to accounts payable. Um, if there is a problem, at accounts payable, they'll let us know. If we just do not see the payment request, we'll remind them. Because once again, even though there are so there's so much technology involved, it's still very human work. So sometimes humans just kind of miss an email, uh, miss a, a notification. So yeah, just in case, if they send the invoice over and we've got a signed SLA, and uh, it is time to pay those invoices and nothing happens. Let us know and we can track that down. Now at the end of the grant project, the institution will send the final invoice once the final report is sent. Some institutions will send it directly along with the final report. That's really cool. Um, we've got a form that does as an optional part ask you for an invoice. You don't have to have it when you send in the final report. But it does make things faster because then we already have the invoice ready to go. We don't have to go. You sent the final report. Can you send us the invoice? Um, it depends on the institution, though. Uh, a lot of times you'll need proof that you sent the final report in order for them to create the invoice. That's also fine. Um, I think a lot of this has to do with wanting to make sure that the invoices get turned around in a timely manner. Um, for the final report, we are usually processing these invoices all at the same time, uh, past the deadline. So if you've gotten your final report done like two months before and you're like, wow, check this out, and it gets sent to us, often what we'll do is check in and say, we usually pay our invoices uh, by the end of the deadline. Is this OK? If there's something critical where it absolutely needs to get paid before then, we can do that. Uh, it's just that usually what we do is we check all of the final reports at once. Um, and then from there, we check all of the invoices at the same time, and then we start making all of the payment requests uh, at once. Uh, the semester status report is the first report that you'll probably have to make if you're a transformation grant team. If you're a continuous improvement grant team, you won't have to do this part. Uh, this is an this is a semester by semester check to see how the project is going. How's the status of your implementation? That kind of thing. 
Um, it's an online form. It is a Google form. So if you try to fill this out from a place that bans Google or firewalls it, um, I've seen it happen in China. I have not yet seen it happen from the Middle East, but I know that there are uh, some countries that may block Google Forms. Uh, let me know through email and we can just do it through Word at that point. Um, it includes some multiple choice and short paragraph questions. It is a check in. It's, it's a thing to make sure that everything's going just fine. If you have any questions for us, um, you know, any any changes to personnel, uh, that kind of thing. And that link is always available on the Grantee Information Center. Uh, and I will once again send you this. You'll hear it more than once today. So this is the Grantee Info page that has the deadlines and the links to all the reports. Now, the semester status report questions. Sorry about that. Just need to make sure my that's all right. Um, there's you know the info on who is submitting the report. Of course, we need to make sure we know who is sending what. Um, the proposal info, so make sure that you know your your round and your three digit number or your M three digit number. Uh, the team members who are on the project, especially if they've changed uh, this semester, uh, which semester are you submitting it for? You don't need it to be um, on your final semester, but you'll need to confirm what the final semester of your project is. Uh, or asking things like, is it on track? Which phase of implementation are you in? Are you teaching with it? Are you creating it? Um, what, what are the materials you're using? Now, if you're using a long list of materials, do not worry about trying to put it in a Google form. That is a very tedious thing. Um, you can just send me a quick word list or an Excel list uh, through email and I will just attach that as a hyperlink to this semester status report. Uh, that's a lot easier at that point. But let's say that you're using OpenStax algebra and trigonometry. You link that, that's fine. Uh, status of the materials review or adaptation. How's it going? How are, how is the, how are the new materials going? Are you hosting them anywhere uh, new that are a place that we didn't uh, anticipate? That's pretty cool. Uh, status of course redesign. So how you know how is it in terms of all the developing all of the modules, stuff like that? Uh, catch all questions like are there any other things that you got to do? Uh, impact estimate changes, not like well, we think we're going to have one less student in this semester, but if five sections disappear or a whole bunch more students are able to take your course and there's an enrollment boom. That's the kind of change to impact that we really need. Or let's say that a textbook that you were replacing uh, went from $250 to $20. They said, ah, it's out of print. We'll just print it on demand now. It's 20 bucks. Well, we'll need to know that so that we're calculating savings correctly. Uh, if it fluctuates a little bit. That's just the market. That's just kind of how it goes. Uh, but any big changes we would definitely need to know. And then of course the big catch all. Do you have any other questions? Now the final report that is only submitted at the end of the final semester of the project. You are not submitting a semester status report and a final report on the same semester. The final semester you do not do a semester status report. We try to make that clear with kind of an if then. If it's your, not your final semester, this is due. If it's your final semester, this is due. This is always, uh, as again, uh, in, it's available from the Grants Information Center. And the final reports depend on which kind of project you do. There's one for transformation and there's one for continuous improvement. Uh, we ask some things of transformation grants like um, your qualitative and quantitative measures. Those are not always going to be in a continuous improvement grant. Um, in the same way, there's going to be a bigger description, uh, maybe a link to materials that have been created uh, from the materials on a continuous improvement grant that may not be as detailed in a transformation grant. So be sure you're using the right one. So let's uh, just quickly walk through one of these reports. I'm going to 
just bring this up on my screen. Uh, it is not up yet. Let me just get right to the Grantee Information Center page and I'm going to share the screen with you. Here we go. Perfect. OK, so the uh, final report. We've got one for transformation grants. Uh, this is the online submission form, and this is the template that you want to fill out before you do any of that. Same with continuous improvement grants. That's right below. Here's the final report submission form, and here is the template. So I'm going to go and open up a copy of the final report template for transformation grants. So the first section, this is all about your info, uh, including the amount uh, that you're affecting when it goes to uh, just the pilot round or just that first semester of implementation. So the total number of students affected during the project. This is so when we do a summary report of all the final reports, we can say during the course of the project, this many students were affected for this many uh, savings. Now each final report has a narrative. This one is more about your transformation experience. Uh, has it impacted the way uh, that you teach in any way? Has it impacted the way that students learn? Um, any lessons learned, things that you would do differently next time? Uh, any materials that you created or revised, and of course you're going to include the open license that your materials are shared under. That is usually an attribution license. Uh, we went over that in the kickoff asynchronous training, but of course if you have any questions on open licensing, uh, reach right out and we can help you with that. Quotes, uh, so we want three quotes from students evaluating their experience. These do not have to be uh, shining, happy uh, quotes. These really need to engender the overall look at it. Uh, some students may have disagreed with uh, the formatting. I really like things in print or I really like things digital or something like that. Uh, you want to get uh, three quotes that kind of overall illustrate their experience. This way we have some uh, some student insight that we can then share on things like the, um, the summary report. Now for qualitative and quantitative measures, the uniform measurements are ones that we ask everybody. Uh, this is overall bird's eye view, uh, positive, neutral, negative uh, for the student opinion of materials, the uh, learning outcomes and or grades, um, whatever it is that is being measured for most people that is going to be things like GPA or even uh, ex particular exam scores. There are some standardized uh, evaluations out there for particular courses. That is also another way to evaluate learning outcomes for sure. Um, DFW rates or uh, basically course level retention. Uh, have students dropped, failed or withdrawn uh, at a in a positive change so meaning of course a lower percentage of students are dropping, failing, withdrawing or getting DF and withdrawing. Um, is it no change? Uh, is it a negative change, which would usually be an increase? That's the weird thing about this one. Negative meaning things have gone up because these rates are, uh, this, these rates in basically entail lower course retention. There's the measures narrative, so this is about all of the stuff that you've measured, including the unique measures that your team and your team alone are doing. So yeah, we have some things in here where you can talk about things like the DFW Delta rates and average GPA, uh, but any surveys, interviews, qualitative measures, uh, anything about the comparison between uh, pre-transformation and post-transformation. Then there's the sustainability plan. So how will this be kept up moving forward? Uh, that's a really important part of all of this. The future affordable materials plans. Um, are you thinking of expanding this? Are you going to maybe go into other courses with this in the future? That's cool. Um, any scholarship plans as well? Uh, papers, presentations, publications. It can be as direct as we are submitting an article in this journal, or it can be 
somewhat vague because that's coming up. Uh, we plan to present on this at a conference at, in this discipline or at the USG Teaching and Learning Conference, wherever it is. We just want to know if you have some scholarship plans uh, connected to that. And you can submit a photo of the team or a photo of uh, you and a class. That's really cool. Um, you know, we can then um, use that in kind of promotional stuff for ALG, but this is optional. It used to be required, uh, especially now um, in the COVID-19 era, uh, getting everybody together is really tough to do. So it's an optional thing that you can do. And anyway, in this description, uh, you would list the names of the people that you want to be listed along with their roles if applicable. We will not show the names of the students if that ever happens. Uh, and if you even share them here, we won't share them out for sure. So that is how the transformation grant final report is. This one, oh wait, that's the submission form. Let's go back. This template is for continuous improvement grants. It looks somewhat similar, but there are a couple of differences. So I have to once again get a drink here. Um, so project narrative, this is about the creation, uh, including your lessons learned. If you're developing something as a team, there's probably some good lessons learned here too. But you won't see um, things like an impact on uh, student teaching and or teaching and learning and student learning. Like if you have that, that's great, but <coughs> it's not entirely necessary for this narrative. There's a description of the materials. Um, we will probably be using these in the open ALG description field um, that allows people to know what something is all about. It also helps with search engines too. You want to include the open license your materials will be shared under. It's usually a CC BY license. Uh, it could be something else though. Uh, for materials links, if you're hosting things in places other than open ALG, just link it here. Um, it's really cool for us to know where that stuff is, but also if you're linking to high file size content, this would be the place where we can go and get it from uh, as opposed to email or the form. And then there's the future plans to so any plans, papers, presentations, publications, uh, any plans to revise or add to these materials in the future. So it's a shorter report uh, and it's more centered around uh, the design and the revision of materials than it is about uh, transforming your course for obvious reasons. They're two different kinds of projects. Uh, there are some reporting guidelines down here and all that stuff, but you've seen this. This is part of the grants info page or the grantee information center, which is the title. OK, so I'm going to shift back to the PowerPoint again. And in order to do so, I once again have to redo this. Here we go. That is fine. It is loading. And there we are. OK, loading the presentation. Oh, great. It's all the way at the beginning. Let's go all the way back to where it is here. Good. So the link to submit these final reports is there. For transformation, there are five items that are either required or optional. Um, one is the Word document. That is your final report. <coughs> Another one is all data. And you can use a zip folder um, if you like, if you have more than one file. Um, syllabi, so the same here. If you have like five courses, you can just put them all in one zip file. That's totally fine with me. You can just uh, include them all that way. Uh, a photo of your team or your class, which is optional, and the second invoice if your institution gives you it beforehand, which is optional. For continuous improvement, there is at least one item. There's at least the final report, which probably at that point would have a link to the materials in it. But if the materials are linked in the Word document, that's all. But if you if not, then send them in from here or send at least the link. Now, if your materials have a, <coughs> a small combined file size, you could just 
email them over or send them directly through the final report. If it doesn't work, uh, send them in a Google folder or in a Dropbox folder and uh, just send the link over to us either by email or on your final report. Um, you can host them on your campus web page. You can link them, link us to them in the final report. You can also attach them in an email. The method doesn't matter so much. We just need to get the materials and we'll share them from there and we'll host them after that. Uh, be sure that if you are sending a photo, you're not sending uh, an amalgamation of campus website headshots. Uh, it just doesn't work when we actually want to share this out on a slideshow at the teaching and learning conference or anything like that. Uh, so yeah, just be sure to send a, a good high resolution photo. Your phone will take uh, a photo that's high enough resolution for anything we want to work on. So the upcoming reporting deadlines. The next one that you're going to see is December 20th. You do not have to submit a report for December 20th. Uh, I don't need to ask you in 10 days if anything has changed that it may have and you can email me if you would like but there's no requirement to send in a report for this round on december 20th um, the next one the first semester status report for the transformation folks would be may 16th and then summer 2022 which would be the next semester status report and possibly if you selected it the final report for a continuous improvement grant is August 15th. In fall 2022, that's most people's final report at that point, is going to be December 19th. And that's just because of how the calendar goes. And of course, these deadlines and all of the links to the reports are on the Grantee Information Center page that I shared with you in chat, and that I will send again in an email that asks you to please bookmark the Grants Information Center page. Um, this is the this is kind of our syllabus in the phrase. It's in the syllabus. Uh, the stuff that we the stuff that's really critical for you to uh, fill out your project and know when it's due and all that stuff. It's all going to be right there on this page. OK, and we are adding everybody to the ALG grantees L listserv. Um, usually, if we send a general email, it won't have brackets, but most of the time they'll have some sort of brackets. Uh, if it's just for you, it'll be R20 or maybe R20 continuous improvement or R20 transformation. Most of the time, it's an entire year's worth of rounds because it's just some people have stuff due and we're sending out a reminder. Um, if you're replying to the entire listserv, be very careful. Um, if you're sending something to me and there's account numbers attached, there's names and phone numbers and all kinds of personally identifiable information on there. If you send it to me, that's OK. If you send us the entire listserv, you're going to get a lot of people with your personal information. You're also going to get a lot of grantees going, ah, oh, this listserv, oh man, I can't believe. It. Don't worry about that. Uh, if you have any personal questions, uh, or any questions that really have to do specifically with your group, uh, let us know um, until I would say the beginning of March. Just send it to me after that. You can send it to both of us. Uh, otherwise, you'll just get an auto reply from Tiffany because she is currently taking care of her baby. So yeah, that's just a little bit about the listserv. Uh, once you're done with the grant, if this is your last grant and you don't want to be on the grantees listserv anymore, that's OK. There are instructions at the bottom of the email on how you can unsubscribe. But if you're in the process of it, please stay subscribed until uh, until that point. And yeah, that'll be uh, you, you'll have the directions right on there. So that is it for paperwork. Uh, so I can't wait to see what happens next with these projects, but do you have any questions before we adjourn? I am just going to leave this open to you. I'm going to hit mute to make sure I'm not talking over anyone. Here we go. Uh, hey, Jeff, this is Lee. Do you mind sharing the slides you used today? Yes, 
So on the Grantee Information Center page, the first thing that's going to be shared are those slides under the kickoff meeting documents. Okay. Um, we're also going to email it out to this to this group just to make sure that you get them. Uh, the video is going to take a little longer to process because we have breaks now, so we have to cut the breaks, which means we have to use Adobe, which means my computer has to chug along and sound like a jet engine for a while as it uh, processes all of that. So the video processing will take a, a little while, but the slides will be sent out immediately. Thanks, Dr. Lange. Thanks, Dr. Lee. Uh, Jeff, I have a quick question. Yep. So, uh, as you know, my team is making a series of lecture videos, and we need a hard drive to store those, and that, that was in our grant and all, but we will need that up front once we start filming, probably in January, February of, of this coming semester. So how does that work in terms for paying for that since the money is distributed 50 percent, 50 percent? You know, we will need that to purchase that uh, very early on. So this will be the first uh, the first utterance in round 20 of this definitely depends on your institution, but it does. Um, you'll want to get in contact with your financial people as soon as possible. Some of them upon receiving the award notification could run a line of credit for the whole thing and you'd be able to pay for it in no time. Uh, others will wait for exactly when the invoice is paid and that has to do with how quickly everybody signs it and then how quickly accounts payable pays our payment request once we send it to them. Okay. Should I wait until next week when you send the SLA out and that starts, you know, hitting my business office and all that? Well, you already have the notification of award part of this. Um, if your office runs a line of credit from the beginning based on the notification of award, then it could be as easy as contacting them now. Uh, it may be that they don't, and in which case you probably want to wait until the SLA uh, gets sent out. Bronson, I would probably say uh, contact Chrissy Shanahan um, okay. and see what she says to do. Uh, uh, will do. I'll send an email out uh, after this meeting. Perfect. Thank you, Jeff. No problem.